Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to the second part of our complex numbers series. So today, our crash course will be focusing on the important exam strategies you need to ace those difficult questions that may come out uh, about complex numbers, right? So 80% of questions asked in complex numbers are of three forms. So the first type of question will be on uh, basic conversion between forms of complex numbers, finding modulus and argument, representation on argon diagram operations, uh, so on and so forth. Then we have algebraic manipulation and polynomials with both real and complex coefficients. All right, so we're going to dive right in to the first type of question on basic operations. Okay, so given 3z minus 4 where z is a complex number equals to 5e to the power of i times pi over 3, find z in the exact form x plus i, y. And part 2 asks us to find the argument and modulus of e to the power of z. Right, so to do these type of questions, you need to be very comfortable with how to convert between the forms, the different forms, like rectangular form, polar form, and uh, exponential form of complex numbers. Okay, so uh, to do this question, the first thing we want to do is we want to convert uh, this thing over here uh, into rectangular form. Right, so we first convert it to polar form by writing it as so. 5e, right, this over here is equals to 5 times cosine pi over 3 plus i sine pi over 3. Right, next we realize that cosine pi over 3 is equals to half, so this is 5 over 2, and sine pi over 3 is equals to square root 3 over 2, so we get something like this. Right, and now a uh, simple rearrangement will allow us to obtain z is equals to 13 over 6 plus 5 root 3 over 6 i. Right, so we've expressed z in a rectangular form as desired. Now the next part asks us to find the argument and modulus of e to the power of z. So how we do this is we simply write out e to the power of z as follows. We write uh write it write z in its rectangular form from the first part, right? So we get this and then we can split up the exponents here as such. Right, so this is actually equals to our r is equals to our modulus and uh, this term over here, 5 root 3 over 6, is equals to our argument. So we write it as follows. This equals to e to the power of 13 over 6. And argument of e to the z is equals to 5 root 3 over 6. Now before you write this down as your final answer, you have to make sure that this value is in between minus pi and pi. Right? Okay, but here... It is, is roughly equals to about, I think about 1.44. Right, so this is our final answer for argument. Right, so the next type of question uh, that you like to test is the conditions for the complex number to be real or imaginary, etc, etc. Right, a commonly tested example would look something like this. So let w equals to 1 plus square root 3i and z equals to minus 4 e to the power of i times minus pi over 6. So find the smallest value of n, where n is a positive integer such that w to the n over the conjugate of z is purely imaginary. Right, so upon first glance at this question, we realize there's, there's a lot going on, right? So one of the first problems we have is that z is not written in proper exponential form because its modulus is negative. This doesn't mean, uh, however, that z isn't a complex number. It still is a complex number, we just have to find out how to make the modulus a positive value. Right. And they want the, the, the conjugate of z here instead of just z itself, and they want to raise this w written in rectangular form to the power of n. And they want it to be purely imaginary. So, okay, 
In order to do this question, we'll need a few of these properties that we've learned about modulus and argument. So the product and the division of modulus, you can split it up like this. And argument becomes addition and subtraction. Okay, so I want to bring your attention to these last two conditions over here. In order for a complex number to be completely real, which means uh, the coefficient in front of the i is 0, so there's no imaginary part, the argument must be equal to k pi. Okay, why is this so? So if you think about it, uh, uh, if we draw the argon diagram, right? Let's say we have a random uh, imaginary number, a complex number z with real and imaginary parts. So the argon diagram uh, dictates that the horizontal axis is the real axis and the vertical axis is the imaginary axis. Okay, so in order for a number to be completely real, uh, it must lie along this axis, right? So remember our argument starts from the positive real axis. So if we rotate it pi uh, degrees, pi radian, sorry, we'll get to a point on this axis as well. So this is pi, and then we rotate another pi, 2 pi, we get back to this line, and then uh, 3 pi, 4 pi, etc, etc. So we see that the argument for a complex number to be completely real is equals to k pi, so the multiple of pi. If it's imaginary, means it instead of making these kinds of full revolutions, it starts off by making a half revolution. Right? This is pi over 2, and it lies completely on the imaginary axis. And then we continue to rotate it by another pi. So this is 3 over 2 pi, and then 5 over 2 pi, so on and so forth. Right, so these are very important, and you should remember them as they'll be helpful in writing this question, in writing the condition in a mathematical form in order for us to solve the question. Okay, so first we want to convert all the complex numbers concerned into standard forms first, right? So as mentioned before, z in the question is not actually in standard exponential form. And for w, they want to raise it to the power of n, right? And uh, if we try and use the rectangular version of w, it's going to be very difficult to raise it to the power of n as we have to turn to uh, binomial expansion, which is certainly not the case and not what we want to do like, when it comes to complex number questions. Okay, so first we convert w over here into uh, exponential form. And as for z, we have to convert the minus 4 to 4. So I'm going to illustrate how to convert z into this proper form over here where the modulus is positive. Right. So we first write this out in polar form. We write, uh, sorry, z equals to minus 4 cosine of minus pi over 6 plus i sine minus pi over 6, right? And then we try and make this modulus positive. So we remove the negative sign and bring it inside. So it looks like this. Right, okay. So uh, we realize this isn't really in the form that we, we are looking for. Right, be because there's a slight issue, because instead of cosine plus i sine, we have these negative signs here that we, we don't really want. So what we're going to do is we're going to make use of these two properties. Sine of negative x equals to minus sine x, and cosine of minus x equals to cosine x. So using these two properties, we can write it like this. So the minus pi over 6 simply becomes pi over 6, and the minus in the sign comes out, so it becomes a plus. Right, so as we can see, we've managed to get rid of one of those pesky negative signs, but we still have this other one to handle here. Right, so the next property we're going to introduce is to do with pi minus x. So sine of x is actually the same as sine of pi minus x. Okay, but cosine of x equals to minus cosine of pi minus x. So if you were to replace the angle inside with pi minus pi over 6, this sign has to go, right? So the minus becomes a positive, then we change the angle inside to pi minus pi over 6. And then we can harmlessly change this pi over 6 to pi minus pi over 6 because we know it wouldn't change this sign over here. And 
we have it in our desired polar form. So we have cosine 5 pi over 6 plus i sine 5 pi over 6. Right, and then we can, uh, we have the argument 5 pi over 6 in the desired form. So remember, the minus pi over 6 here isn't actually the argument. We have to convert it into the proper standard form before we can see what the true argument is. And then we can write it in exponential form. So it becomes like this. Okay, so that is how we convert this uh, non-standard form into the more standard exponential form. All right, so take some time to copy this down if you need to remember how, how we can do this. All right, so after doing that, we now try and find the argument of what they want, w to the n over the conjugate of z, because we know that uh, for a complex number to be purely imaginary, we have to look at its argument. Argument must be k plus half times pi. So when we find the argument, we can proceed to use some of the uh, properties we know about argument and equate it to the difference between the argument of the numerator and the denominator. Right, so argument of w to the n is simply n multiplied by the argument of w because if we raise this to the power of n, we are essentially multiplying this exponent by n. Okay, and the argument of uh, the conjugate of z is simply equals to minus or the negative of the argument of z, right? So it's equals to minus 5 pi over 6. And if we simplify it, we get 2n plus 5 over 6 times pi. And we know that for the complex number to be purely imaginary, this 2n plus 5 over 6 times pi must be equals to k plus half times pi. So if we do some simplifications, we'll find that the smallest n, where n is a positive integer, is equals to 2 because the condition boils down to n plus 1 being a multiple of 3. So 2 plus 1 is, the n is 2 is the, definitely the first positive integer that satisfies this condition. All right, so there's a rough guide on how we approach these type of questions. So next we're going to jump right into the, the topic of algebraic manipulations. So the first kind of question will be on direct calculation. So it's not the simple calculating of the product of two complex numbers, but instead it might look something like this. Okay, the question says let z be a complex number such that the modulus of z equals to 2. Find the modulus of z minus 4i divided by 1 plus iz. So pause this video. Take a while to try this question. It's actually modified from the A-level paper, uh, H2 Mathematics paper 1 last year. And I think it was one of the hardest questions in the paper. And I myself remember spending uh, more than 20 minutes or even half an hour on this question. All right, so don't be afraid if, don't be worried if you can't solve it, just give it a shot and we'll review the solution after this. All right, so uh, we're going to look at this question now. So this sort of questions require clever manipulation of products, modulus and conjugates. So we really need to use all the relevant properties taught in part one. Okay, this is on definitely on the harder end of the spectrum of complex number questions. Okay, so we first notice that since the modulus of z is equals to two, we can uh, simply let z equals to two e i to the theta, and we get the conjugate of z to be four over z. And then we can take out the factor z from the numerator. And with this 4 over z term over here, we can replace it with z conjugate. And then we continue to use some properties and notice a few more things. And we realize it will reduce very nicely to the modulus of z, which is equals to 2. So you can pause the video for a while and take a look at all these steps and try and get uh, how each step leads to the next. But right, we see all these notice, notice, and what if... I can't really notice all these. It's very, uh, it's a lot to ask for, right? It's uh, it's not intuitive and in a stressful timed environment, in an exam setting, it's very, very difficult to come up with all these uh, from nowhere. So in H2 math, you rely on two things to score well, either your brain or your fortitude. If one isn't working well, use the other. So 
if you can't seem to think of the very inspirational and motivated uh, solution, usually uh, some kind of brute force or persevering long enough at a method known to definitely work will turn out well and give you the correct answer. Okay, so as I said earlier, in a lot of these questions, hard work usually pays off. So what we're going to do is we can let z equals to x plus i y. This is a rectangular form of complex numbers then. After we do that, we simplify, we find the real term, the imaginary term, and then we find modulus the hard way using the Pythagoras theorem formula. Okay, so when we let z equals x plus i y, we substitute it in into both z terms in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, and then we try and write it neatly in terms of its rectangular form both on top and on the bottom. Okay, and then the next thing we do is we rationalize the denominator by multiplying it by its conjugate, which is 1 minus y minus xi. And we have to multiply the same to the top as well. And then we just have to do some algebraic expansion and we will get this form over here, minus 3x plus minus 8 plus 5y times i over 5 minus 2y. Right. And another thing I want you to notice is that since we let z equals to x plus i y, right, the formula for the modulus is simply square root of x squared plus y squared, and this is equals to 2. So x plus x squared plus y squared is e actually equals to 4. Okay. So remembering this, we have our form over here, right? Our form, and then now what we want to do is we want to find the modulus squared. So in order to do, okay, sorry, the square is supposed to be outside. In order to do this, we can realize that this is actually minus 3x over 5 minus 2y plus minus 8 plus 5y over 5 minus 2yi. Right, so this is actually a complex number in a rectangular form because we were able to change the denominator to a real number by rationalizing the denominator. So if you want to find the modulus of this squared is simply taking uh, this term squared plus the coefficient of i squared, right? Which is equal to this. And if we simplify it and use x squared plus y squared equals to 4, we will be able to get uh, it very nicely reduced to be exactly equal to 4. And therefore, the modulus of z minus 4i over 1 plus iz is equal to 2. And we have to reject uh, minus 2, of course, because we know that modulus must be non-negative. Right, so as we can see, most of these questions that have a high mark will require you to get your hands dirty, especially if you can't think of the most elegant solution. Right, so this usually happens very often in the next type of questions on simultaneous equations. So the simultaneous equations that are tested in a complex numbers topic would contain two equations and two variables. So these are very frequently tested and in most cases, solving them is just like solving any simultaneous equation involving two real numbers. You use one equation to represent one variable, using the other variable then you substitute it into the second equation. So a basic example would uh, look like, uh, like, like so. For solve for complex numbers a, b, the simultaneous equations ia plus b equals to minus 2 plus i and a multiplied by b plus 1 equals to 7 plus 4i. Okay, so keep in mind a and b here are complex numbers. So first we want to represent b in terms of a and we can do this very easily using the first uh, the first equation over here. Right, this one. And once we do this, we can substitute it in into equation 2. And then we do some simplifications. Now we have an equation in terms of a only. So we can actually use the quadratic formula. Do remember the quadratic formula still works even though your coefficients are not real, right? It still works. So if we key into the quadratic formula, or if you use your GC, rather, you get a equals to 2 plus 3i or minus 1 minus 2i. Okay, as far as I remember, we can't use the scientific calculator to key in uh, uh, complex coefficients, so you have to use your GC's uh, equation solver. Okay, so after we get our values for A, we can then find the corresponding values for B, and we will then have solved our simultaneous equations. Right, so as I said earlier, this is a rather straightforward example, and a complex number can have a conjugate and modulus, so they may like to test that in uh, 
these linear equations as well, these simultaneous equations, right? So here we have another harder question that asks us to solve for complex numbers w and z. Uh, the simultaneous equations z plus i multiplied by the conjugate of w equals to 2 plus 6i and the modulus of z minus w is equals to 3 plus i. So substitution looks like an absolute mess here because we have conjugates and we have modulus there's a lot of things to take care of, right? And this question can probably be done using you know an elegant solution, the kind of solution that you expect in the answer key lah, right? But here, if we have no time and no brain power to come up with these kind of things, uh, what are we gonna do? We have to rely on our fortitude, and we can do the so-called brute force substitution by replacing z with x plus i y is rectangular form, right? How it usually pays off with this kind of substitutions. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to replace w with a plus b i and z with c plus d i and we're going to bash this out. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do here is we are going to substitute in uh, these two rectangular forms into our equations here. So we start with the first equation, right? z equals to c plus d i, c plus d i plus i multiplied by the conjugate of w equals to 2 plus 6 i. And if we do some simplification here, we get uh, c plus b plus a plus d i equals to 2 plus 6 i. So comparing coefficients, we get uh, b plus c equals to 2 and a plus d equals to 6. Mm. Right, now we look at the second equation, mod of z minus w equals to 3 plus i. So the mod of z is equal to square root of c squared plus d squared minus a minus b i equals to 3 plus i. Right, so if we do some simple reshuffling, we get a plus 3 plus b plus 1 i. Now we know that c and d are both real numbers as defined. So this square root here has to be a real number as well, right? Uh, because we are adding the squares of two real numbers, which must be non-negative. So this means that it cannot contain an imaginary part, or rather, this term is equal to 0. So since b plus 1 is equal to 0, b is equal to minus 1. And using this equation over here, we get c equals to 3. And now what we are going to do is substitute in these values, c equals to 3, into this equation. So we get 9 plus d squared equals to a plus 3. And a is equals to 6 minus d. So it becomes 9 minus d. And now we have an equation in one variable. If we square both sides, 9 plus d squared equals to 81 minus 18d plus d squared. Okay, so the d squared cancels out. 18d is equals to 72. Hence, d is equals to 4. And if we sub it back in here, we get a equals to 2. So w is equals to 2 plus bi, which is minus 1. So it's equals to 2 minus i. And z here will be equals to 3 plus 4i. Simple as that. Yeah. So do you all remember this trigonometry, uh, this identity that we have over here converting between rectangular form polar form and exponential form. The middle one, the polar form, gives exam setters a very good excuse to relate complex numbers to trigonometry. So these questions are almost exactly like those questions asking you to prove trigonometric identities in the O-levels and honestly they can, they can be quite sienna because they are testing you on both complex numbers and trigonometric identities and manipulations. But all you need to do is to push through it and press on. Right, so uh, we have an example for you to try over here. It's modified from MJC Prelims 2018. It's a two-part question. The first part asks you to show some properties, uh, some identities that contain both uh, exponential form of complex numbers and sine. And then the second part of the question is a hence part that asks you to prove this identity that uh, absolute the modulus of uh, 1 minus z plus z squared minus z cubed equals to some kind of trigonometric identity. So do pause the video, give this question a shot, give it your best shot, in fact, and after this we'll go through the solution. 
Alright, so we're going to be starting with the first part of the question first. So it asks us to show that 1 minus e to the i uh, theta is equal to this expression shown over here. And as you can see, this expression shown over here has an e to the i theta over 2 term factored out. So we're going to try and do that. Alright, if we factor this out, we'll be left with e i to the minus theta over 2 minus e i theta over 2. Right, and then we can write each of these terms here in their polar form because we want to get like in terms of cosine and sine and hope you know the cosine terms cancel out so be cosine minus theta over 2 plus i sine minus theta over 2 minus cosine theta over 2 minus i sine theta over 2 and the next thing we have to do is to convert each of these uh, uh, angles in here into their positive versions so that we can do the cancellation. So we recall that cosine of minus x is equals to cosine of x. Right, so we can simply remove the negative sign. But for sine, we have to bring out the negative sign. So it becomes minus i sine theta over 2 minus cosine theta over 2 minus i sine theta over 2. So now we can cancel the cosine terms out and we will get the desired result. Okay, so for the other case, it's almost exactly the same. So do try it out. And essentially what you're doing is you're replacing this with a addition sign. So these all become pluses. And instead of the cosine terms cancelling out, now your i sine terms cancel out, leaving 2 cosine theta over 2. Okay, so now we're going to try the second part. Alright, so next we have to solve the second part of this question, right? And the word hence here gives us a very good starting point, right? This word hence here tells us that uh, we have to try and use what we derived in the first part of the question in order to maybe try and solve this very weird identity. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is rewrite this thing inside the modulus 1 minus z plus x squared minus z cubed is equals to we can factor out the z square for the remaining two terms and it will look something like this. And then if you recall, we can actually separate the products so we will get something like this. All right, from our properties to do with modulus. Okay, so we know that we actually have this 1 minus z here already. So what we need to take care of is the 1 plus z squared. Okay? So there's something we can do that looks very attractive, which is to actually multiply these two things over here. Okay, why is this an, a very attractive thing to do? Is that because multiplying these two will give us 1 minus z squared, which is, you know, kind of close to what we need. And then maybe we can try and find z later in terms of these and find 2z squared and then add it. Okay, so that's the first thing we're going to try, right? So 1 minus z squared will be equals to the product of these two. These two will combine to become ei theta, and then we multiply these two brackets, we get minus 4i sine theta over 2 cosine theta over 2. Right, and then now we have to find 2z squared. So next, we are going to take this and subtract it with this. So 1 plus z minus 1 minus z will give us e i theta over 2, 2 cosine theta over 2, minus, minus 2i sine theta over 2, so it becomes plus. Right, so this is actually equals to 2z, and it's equals to 2 e i theta over 2 cosine theta over 2 plus i sine theta over 2. Right, so we can just cancel out the 2 and we'll get z equals to e to the power of i theta over 2 times cosine theta over 2 plus i sine theta over 2. And next, uh, we want to square this because when we square it, then we can multiply it by 2 and then add it to this. So when we square it, we get e i theta 
Mm, then the inside will become cosine squared theta over 2 minus sine squared theta over 2 plus 2i cosine theta over 2 sine theta over 2. Right, and then remember we want to find 2z squared, not just z squared, because we need to add 2z squared to this in order to get 1 plus z squared. Right, so if we multiply this by 2, there will be a 2 that comes out here, an extra 2 here, and this will become 4. Okay, so this might all look very complicated, but we realize that when we add this and this term together, we have the same uh, same factor, right? Ei theta. And this 4i sine theta over 2 cosine theta over 2 will cancel out with this one over here, which makes it very beautiful. And all we are left with is 1 plus z squared equals to ei theta. We, we just have to look at these two terms over here, right? Because the other two will cancel out. So we get 2 cosine squared theta over 2 minus 2 sine squared theta over 2. And we can factor out the two. This becomes cosine squared theta over 2 minus sine squared theta over 2. And if we know our double angle formula, this thing right here is actually equals to a very nice result, cosine theta. That's it. Right? Okay, so if we realize, what are they looking for here? They're looking for the modulus of this multiplied by the modulus of this. Okay, so actually, there isn't really a need to separate it out but it might help you see a little easier. So if we multiply it inside, it becomes the modulus of 2 e i theta cosine theta. And the other term would be 1 minus z, which is this thing over here. So we're just going to copy it. e i theta over 2 minus 2i sine theta over 2. Okay, and now we want to try and simplify the thing inside a little bit. It becomes uh, becomes minus four mm, minus four e to the i three theta over two cosine theta sine theta over two. Right. So as you can probably see. The, this thing is starting to really look like what we want, right? And we're actually done because this is the complex number over here, right? e to the power of i3 theta over 2. This is the exponential form. This is the complex number. So everything else must be part of the modulus. So the modulus of this is simply the modulus of everything excluding the complex number, which is equals to 4 cosine theta sine theta over 2. And we've shown the identity. Okay, so this is one of the hardest possible questions they can ever test to do with trigonometry. So don't worry if you can't solve it. Right, so some tips and tricks for these types of questions. Always be on the lookout for real and imaginary parts and separate them if it is necessary or if it makes calculations easier. Right, and always uh, know the double angle formula, addition formula and factor formulas right at the back of your head, right? Whenever you see trigonometry. And just like trigger proofs in the O levels, try and work towards the end goal. So if you see that in this identity we had just now, the right hand side has a theta over 2 factored out, then we want to try and start by factoring it out on the left hand side. Okay, so if you haven't yet realized yet, complex number questions uh, usually require you to have a lot of tolerance for algebra, and the, the, which is basically the ability to be fearless in expanding out everything, in brute forcing, and at the same time being very careful not to make mistakes, as well as to spot things that will simplify your calculation. And this really requires a lot of persistent practice and a lot of drilling to get better. Right, so for the final chapter of this topic, we are going to look at polynomials. So the first aspect of this would be polynomials with real coefficients. So most of the time, a question may provide you with a cubic or maybe even a quartic and tell you that all the coefficients are real and they may not give you all the coefficients just yet. Okay, so there are three kinds of things they can ask for. 
It will likely give you a complex root of the polynomial and ask you to number one, find the coefficients of the polynomial, number two, find all the roots of the polynomial, and number three, relating the polynomial to another polynomial. Right? The main testing point for polynomials with real coefficients is always the complex conjugate theorem. Okay, so the complex conjugate theorem states that uh I see. As long as all the coefficients are real, if a plus bi is a root, then a minus bi is a root. So we have an example over here. So pause this video, give it a shot, and we're going to go through the solution after this. Alright, so we're going to look at this question. Given that uh, f of z is equal to z to the 4 plus 2z cubed plus pi squared plus e squared, z squared plus pz plus q, where p and q are both non-negative reals, and that uh, i pi satisfies the equation fz equals to zero. So part one asks us to find exact values of p and q. So first, since, that, since i pi is a root, uh, using the theorem, we know that the other, uh, the conjugate of i pi, which is minus i pi, is also a root. Right, so the trick here is to plug in the roots one by one. And after that, you will get simultaneous equations relating the coefficients that can be solved. Right. So now we're going to plug in. Uh, we're going to plug in uh, i pi, the minus i pi. So. All right. So we know that. Uh, sorry, we know the minus i pi is a root. But maybe we can try plugging in i pi first. Uh, when we plug in i pi, we get uh, i pi to the four plus. 2i pi to the 3 so we just write it out neatly first right and then we simplify this so this becomes this becomes a minus pi squared so minus pi to 4 minus pi squared Right, and then we can cancel these two out, and then it becomes a we group the imaginary terms together and the real terms together. Right, so since this is equal to zero, we know that this is zero and this is zero. So q is equal to e squared pi squared and p is equal to two pi squared. Right, so we've been able to find the exact values of p and q. Hence, find the remaining roots of f z equals zero in terms in the form of alpha plus beta i, where alpha and beta are exact real numbers. Right, so how are we gonna approach this question? Right, uh what we're gonna do is we're gonna sub in both i pi and minus i pi. And then we try and factor out a polynomial that we can solve with quadratic formula. Okay, so we know that one of the factors to this thing is z minus i pi, since i pi is a root, and z plus i pi is also a root. Right, and this is equals to z squared uh, plus pi squared. So really our remaining quadratic here is just z squared plus a z, and then our q here is e squared pi squared, so our constant term comes from here, e squared. Right, and really all we have to do now is to compare coefficients, right? So if you were to compare the coefficient of z cubed, you get a, right, you see z cubed comes from here, and it actually is the only place where z cubed can come from, so a is 2. Right, so we have to solve the z squared plus 2z plus e squared equals to 0. And from here, we can just use our either our GC or our uh, quadratic formula. Get z equals to minus 2 plus minus square root 4 minus 4 e squared over 2 equals to minus 1 plus minus 1 minus e squared. So we have two roots, minus 1 plus square root 1 minus e squared and minus 1 minus square root of 1 minus e squared. Right, so we've completed this question. And next, we're going to look at polynomials with complex coefficients. Okay, this is really important to note that 
the complex conjugate theorem does not work okay, when our polynomial doesn't have its coefficients all real and instead it has some complex coefficients. Right, so what this means is if a plus bi is a root, a minus bi isn't necessarily a root if the coefficients are complex. Right, so we're going to discuss the techniques involved in solving the various problem types. For example, consider a quadratic equation with complex coefficients like x squared minus 5 minus 2i x plus 7 plus i. Okay, remember that the quadratic formula will still work even though the coefficients are complex. It is the complex conjugate theorem that doesn't work. Right, so we can still substitute it in into the quadratic formula and we'll be able to get something like this. Right, next we have to learn how to we have to recall, sorry, how to settle the square root here. Because this can't be our final answer, right? We know that this is equal to a complex number that we can express in a rectangular form, but we need to be able to express it in the first place. So in order to do that, we let the square root of minus 7 minus 24i be equals to a plus bi, and then we square both sides. So we get a squared minus b squared plus 2abi. Next, if we compare coefficients, we get this and 2ab equals minus 24 so ab equals to minus 12 right and uh, solving this using our calculator we'll get either a equals 3 b equals minus 4 or a equals to minus 3 b equals to 4 but either one you decide to to let it to be the square root doesn't matter because there's a plus minus sign over here Right, so we will still get two distinct solutions. And this set of two solutions are the same for both this and this, so you can use either one of them. Right, okay, next, verifying that a given complex number is a given root of the polynomial. Okay, so perhaps the most straightforward way is to plug in the number into the polynomial to verify that the resultant sum is zero. And especially if they say no calculators are allowed, please show every step of your working. Okay, so an example would be to verify that 1 plus i is a solution to the equation z cubed minus i z squared plus 2 times 1 minus i z minus 4 minus 2i equals 0. Okay, so remember to show every step of your working. So what we're going to do is we're just going to substitute it into z. Right, and we will try to simplify this. Right, 1 plus i, let's do 1 plus i squared first. 1 plus i squared is equal to 1 minus 1 plus 2i, which is simply equals to 2i. And then when we cube it, we multiply by another 1 plus i, so it becomes 2i minus 2. Right, minus i times 2i plus 2 times 1 minus i squared. So it's 1 minus minus 1, which is 2 minus 4 minus 2i. So we get 2i minus 2 plus 2 plus 4 minus, eh, sorry, plus 4 minus 4 minus 2i. And we realize that everything cancels out very nicely to give us 0. And therefore we can verify that 1 plus i is a solution to the equation. Okay, so last but not least, finding the coefficients given the roots. Okay, so again, plot the given roots into the polynomial and either you're done or you're left with a solvable simultaneous equation. So an example would be given 2 plus i is a solution, find p and q. So again, we're going to substitute it in. And next we want to cube 2 plus i. So we start with squaring it, of course. 2 plus i squared is equal to 2 minus 1 plus 4i equals to 1 plus 4i. And then when we multiply this by another 2 plus i, we will get mm, 2 plus 9i and then minus 4. So we get 9i minus 2. Minus i times 1 plus 4i plus p 2 plus i plus q equals 0. And we try and simplify it more. 9i minus 2 minus i plus 4 
plus 2p plus pi plus q equals 0. Now we sort according to the real and imaginary parts. Right? So the real part would be minus 2 plus 4, which is 2, plus 2p plus q. And then our imaginary part would be 9 minus 1, 8i, 8 plus p. So from here, we know that these two are both 0. So p is equals to minus 8. And if we substitute it in here, we get that q is equals to uh, 14. All right, so we've been able to solve the equation in this manner. Okay, uh, next we're going to be moving on to solving the polynomial. So it is really just like how we do it with uh, real coefficient polynomials. So given a root, find the other roots. So what we want to do is just to factor out the root and then we can compare coefficients. Alright, so the question says here that given that z equals minus i is the root of this polynomial over here, express pz as a product of three linear factors. So the first thing we want to do is to write out, uh, to factor out the z equals to minus i factor. Right? And to do that, we are going to factor out z plus i. Right? And then we will have a remaining z squared plus az plus an extra term over here. Right? And we realize that i multiplied by this extra term over here is the only term that will give us a term without x, not, contain, uh, not containing z, sorry. So it is equals to minus 6 plus 9i. So this thing over here is equals to 6i plus 9. Because 6i times i equals to minus 6. 9 times i equals to 9i. And now we simply have to compare the coefficients of z squared. Here the coefficient of z squared is a plus i. Right, this is equals to minus 6 plus i. So a is equals to minus 6 minus 2i. So minus of 6 plus 2i. Right, so we can write pz as equals to z plus i z squared minus 6 plus 2i z plus 6i plus 9. Alright, and now we have to equate this quadratic to 0 and solve for z. So in order to do this, we can just use our quadratic formula. And we get z equals to 6 plus 2i plus minus square root. 6 plus 2i squared minus 4, 1, 6i plus 9 divided by 2. And if we perform a simple simplification, sim simplification right, this is equals to 36 minus 4, 32 plus 24i minus 24i minus 36 over 2. And these two terms cancel out leaving 32 minus 36 on the bottom, which is equals to minus 4. And the square root of minus 4 is equals to 2i. So we get 6 plus 2i plus minus 2i over 2, which is either equals to 3 plus 2i or 3. All right, so we can now express pz as a product of three linear factors. pz will be equals to z plus i, z minus 3, z minus... 3 plus 2i, just like this. Alright, so the last commonly tested question tests you on the relationship between polynomials, right? So just now we managed to solve the roots of this equation, pz, and we found them to be minus i, 3, and 3 plus 2i. Okay, so keep this equation in mind. And a follow-up question for this kind of question may ask you to directly solve using like kind of a hence method. Uh, a polynomial that looks very similar to the one that you solved just now. So they might ask you to hence write down the solutions to the equation minus 6 plus 9i z cubed plus 11i z squared plus 6 plus i z minus i. So we first need to notice the similarity because if they ask us for hence, right, then it must be very similar to the previous part. Lah. Okay, this 6 plus minus 6 plus 9i comes in here, 11 is here, 6 plus i is here. So it, it, it's, the structure is kind of the same, but the, each of these so-called coefficients is paired with a different power of z instead. Right, so the trick for this kind of questions is substitution. So what are we going to substitute? So what we have to notice 
is that the minus 6 plus 9i became an extra, there was an extra z cube at the back. So very likely this entire equation is multiplied by z cube to go from this term to this term. Right? And in order to uh, multiply it by z cube, we, we can't be keeping this as z cube here, right? Because if we multiply z cube by another z cube, we get z to the power of 6. Okay, so we're going to use the substitution. Substitute. Right? z equals to um, i z. Right, we're going to replace all the z's with, sorry, not i z, i over z. Okay, we're going to replace all the uh, z's with i over z. And what happens is we get uh, kind of like a p of i over z equals to i over z cubed minus 6 plus i i over z squared plus 11 i over z minus 6 plus 9i. Right? And if we were to expand this, we will get uh, minus i over z cubed plus 6 plus i over z squared plus 11i over z minus 6 plus 9i. And we want this to be equal to 0, right? So what we can do is we can actually multiply throughout by z cubed. Because you see, the minus i over z cubed becomes minus i. And this term has an extra z cubed at the back. So it kind of makes sense to multiply this by z cubed. So we get minus i plus 6 plus i z because uh, we multiply by z cubed. So we cancel out the z square and we add another z plus 11i z squared minus 6 plus 9i z cubed equals to 0. So we realize that we actually have converted this form into this form by simply substituting i over z into this polynomial over here. So instead of z being equal to minus i 3 or 3 plus 2i, we instead have i over z equals to minus i 3 or 3 plus 2i. Right, and then from here, we are able to solve for the different values of z. So when i over z equals to minus i, z equals to minus 1. When i over 3, no, i over z equals to 3, z equals to i over 3, or 1 third i. And last but not least, when i over z equals to 3 plus 2i, right, then z will be equals to i over 3 plus 2i. And then what we can do here is we can rationalize the denominator, right? So i, 3 minus 2i, and then the bottom will become 3 squared plus 2 squared, which is 13. So this becomes 3i plus 2 over 13 equals to 2 over 13 plus 3 over 13i. So these are our three solutions to this equation. And all we did was make a substitution in the original one to convert it into this new form and replace the z with our substitution. Okay? So some common substitutions of z include uh, some of the follows. It can be the negative or multiplied by i or the reciprocal 1 over z, minus 1 over z, i over z. In this case, the one we used was i over z, right? But there are many other possible substitutions and this can only come by practice. It helps that you have a list of substitutions that you can refer to but practice makes perfect. So you have to repeatedly do these kinds of substitution questions in order to become more familiarized with what substitutions we'll need. Right, so that's the end of this very, very difficult uh, crash course on the problem solving strategies you'll need for complex numbers. Don't worry if you can't absorb everything. Continue doing practice problems in your free time. Work on those very difficult complex numbers questions. And Try and review this video maybe twice or three, even three times. And you know, try doing the questions again. Don't look at the answers so quickly. And after a while, you get a hang of most of the techniques that are taught here. Right? And then you'll be able to ace any question that comes out in the A-level paper. Right? So thank you for tuning in and uh, look out for our next video coming soon.